Thank you all for coming um, to uh, our latest event, the latest event of the IHE here. My thanks especially to De Provost Dominguez and President Garvey and Jean for coming and joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited uh, that you all came, excited uh, to be having a second event already this fall. I'm Joe Capizzi, I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Ecology. Um, as you guys know, the Institute for, Institute for Human Ecology is devoted to studying, understanding, and advancing the conditions that conduce to human flourishing as described in the Catholic intellectual tradition. Inviting George to come back and speak with us speaks, uh, fits right into what we do here. With no disrespect towards any of George's other books, I think with irony of modern Catholic history, George has written perhaps his most timely and important book. As some of you may have heard or seen, we had a little row a couple of weeks here at Catholic University in this very hall. But one thing that struck me about the conversation that we had then was how little many of us know about the story that George tells in this book. I've been thinking, for instance, of how little the current conversation about the ostensible demise and recovery of something after liberalism seems aware of an ongoing conversation that has been occurring at least since figures like Jacques Maritain, John Courtney Murray, and even David Schindler, um, all of whom were a part of this conversation. We need our history as much as ever, if not more so, and we're grateful to have George here tonight remind us of those things that we have to relearn. So we're excited to welcome George back here. Uh, George, as you know, is the Distinguished Senior Fellow and Chair of Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He's the author of, I think, easy over 20 books, um, including, of course, his unparalleled multi-volume biography of John Paul II. We're extremely grateful he's been a friend of the Institute since our very inception and grateful that he would take time to come and speak with us tonight. Before um, I introduce him or you know, welcome him up here tonight, I just want to say a couple things about structure. Um, we will have time for questions and answers after George speaks. We also have some things um, for a reception after that. And George will be signing books to your right um, if you're interested in purchasing and having a book signed um, by George. With regard to questions and answers, people did a pretty decent job of this last time. Perhaps the speakers did a less good job of responding in a concise way. Please make sure it's not a speech, but just a question, something that's direct and George can respond to um, uh, in a timely way to get other people the opportunity to ask other questions that we may have here. I will come back up then once George is done, and I will help call on people. So you'll be looking to me, getting my attention. So when somebody else is asking a question or George is responding, feel free to be looking to me and I'll try to make sure you're queued up and we can get questions from you guys as quickly as possible. Okay, everybody understand the ground rules? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much and welcome George Weigel. Thanks uh, very much, Dr. Capizzi. Good evening. Everyone, it's a great pleasure to be back at Catholic University. This institute, I think, is a very important expression of the renaissance that's underway at Catholic University in these recent years, and I'm delighted to be part of that. I'm particularly happy that Dr. Garvey, President Garvey, showed up tonight since he's already read the book. Um, in fact, he read the galleys and was unkind enough to point out two typos in, uh, in the book, which had escaped the copy editor, me, the production editor, and everyone else. So, uh, John, when you're tired of presidenting, there is a new career awaiting you uh, as a copy editor. Uh, this book, which I'm happy to launch here at Catholic University tonight, this is the book's official publication date, uh, is an explicit exercise in revisionist historiography. There are no new facts in this book. I hope there are a few unknown and, and juicy stories. But there are no new facts. Rather, there's a rearrangement of, of the facts. Those of you who know the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome will remember that along the uh, top of the walls of the apse are these framed mosaic arrangements of biblical scenes known to art, art historians and artists as emblemata. Uh, this book is a kind of emblema. It's 
stones that have been crafted by many distinguished historians rearranged uh, in a new frame, which I hope is a more illuminating frame. What's the rearrangement and what's the irony of the title of the book, The Irony of Modern Catholic History? Well, there are in fact, as the book I think demonstrates, many ironies in the fire of Catholicism's engagement with modernity. Uh, but two of them I want to flag at the beginning because they'll provide a reference point for us as, as we work through the five acts of the drama of Catholicism and modernity. The first of these ironies, and perhaps the meta-irony of the whole business, is that a relationship that began with anathemas being hurled in both directions. Voltaire hollering, écrasez l'enfant, crush the infamy, meaning the Catholic Church. Gregory XVI and Pius IX giving back as good as they got. Somehow, over a process which I will describe historically in a moment, a relationship that began with mutual anathematization ended up inviting, indeed compelling, the Catholic Church to rediscover the essential truth about itself, the core of its self-understanding, and that is the church as a missionary or evangelical enterprise. That happened through this complex encounter with modernity. The second irony in this is that in the course of that evolving relationship, the Catholic Church developed a social doctrine that just might have the capacity in this 21st century to rescue the postmodern world from its own increasing incoherence and self-destructiveness. As I said a moment ago, the drama of Catholicism and modernity unfolds in, in, in the book in five acts. Before I get to a brief description, of each of those acts, it'll be helpful just to clarify some terms briefly. In what follows, by modernity, I mean societies characterized by the decline of aristocracy, inherited power and wealth, the desacralization of power by the sharp differentiation of religious and political authority, and the dominance of political authority in the public sphere, social mobility combined with urbanization and mass education, popular participation in governance, the rationalization and bureaucratization of virtually every aspect of life, great improvements in nutrition and medicine with a concomitant rise in life expectancy, and a vast expansion of the leisure time available to everyone. Which is to say, societies in which the scientific method provides the primary paradigm for human knowledge, neither faith nor religious knowledge is taken for granted, and tensions exist to one degree or another between believers individually and corporately and the ambient public culture. That's modernity. By Catholic Church, for the next 45 minutes, I mean here the teaching authority of Catholicism as embodied in the Bishop of Rome as universal pastor of the church, and at one significant moment, the bishops of the church gathered an ecumenical council with and under the Bishop of Rome. Now, as everyone in this room understands, that by no means exhausts what the Catholic Church means. But given the unique authority structure of Catholicism, this definition provides a manageable focus for considering the drama of Catholicism and modernity. The Catholic Church is wrestling with the profound changes through which humanity has passed since the rise of that scientific method, the triumph of the Industrial Revolution, and the overthrow of traditional political orders has evolved over time. Although the story, as we'll see, is more complex than typically rendered by historians with a secularist cast of mind, uh, 
it is not too great an exaggeration to suggest that the drama of Catholicism and modernity began with a papal preview of Nancy Reagan's anti-drug campaign. Just say no. This was followed by a period of exploration and a search for a reasonable engagement with modernity, which caused considerable internal ecclesiastical quarreling and elbow throwing, some of which was felt on this campus in the early 20th century. Before the forces of engagement prevailed, their triumph reached a high watermark at the Second Vatican Council, whose pastoral constitution on the church and the modern world not only embraced modernity, but celebrated crucial aspects of it. Then, as modernity gave way to post-modernity, two popes of genius began to articulate a deep critique of the modern project from within, in striking contrast to the just say no critique from without. Now, as the church enters more deeply into the third millennium, Catholicism has squarely faced the fact that however its relationship to post-modernity and the contest of worldviews within it evolves, the Catholic future depends on proclamation and evangelization. That is, the church's future, like religious conviction itself, can no longer be a taken for granted thing, but has to be effected. So let's explore this evening the five acts in this drama, which will, I hope, help us see that the conventional telling of this tale, in which modernity acts and Catholicism simply reacts, is just wrong. Act one, Catholicism against modernity. The problem of Catholicism and modernity, the drama of Catholicism and modernity, can be divided, subdivided along several lines of analysis. We could explore the church's relationship to the passing of the traditional political order and the rise of new forms of government, the church's relationship to the passing of the traditional cultural order and the displacement of metaphysics at the center of the Western intellectual project. We could explore the church's relationship to the passing of traditional society and the rise of new forms of community, including new forms of economic life. But however we slice and dice it, the encounter of Catholicism with modernity in the 19th century was inexplicably bound up with the fact that the pope was the sovereign head of a class C minus European power. The Pope ruled the Papal States, which at various moments meant that the Pope was politically sovereign over as much as one third of the Italian peninsula. Now, cultural and intellectual modernity certainly challenged the then regnant forms of Catholic intellectual life. Social modernity in the form of the social question posed by the Industrial Revolution and the emergence of an urban proletariat eventually compelled an entirely new Catholic appraisal of modern economic life and its impacts on society. But it was the challenge of political modernity that was the immediate and urgent question for Pope Gregory XVI, who reigned from 1832 to 1846, and Pope Pius IX, who reigned from 1846 to 1878. Why? Because political modernity and its expression in the Italian Risorgimento threatened the very existence of the papacy as they understood it. And by threatening the papacy as they understood it, political modernity threatened the Catholic Church as they understood it. There were other factors in play here, of course. The Catholic Church in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th, for that matter, paid very little heed to the Anglosphere and to the ways in which the English and, Scot and Scottish Enlightenments led to forms of modernity that were not identical to those that emerged from the French or Continental Enlightenment. Thus, from the point of view of Gregory XVI and Pius IX, the Enlightenment meant primarily the French Revolution, which meant the civil constitution of the clergy, which meant the subordination of the church to the French state, which meant the terror, the suppression of the Vendée, the martyrdoms memorialized in Poulenc's dialogues of the Carmelites, and all the rest of that bloody business. Enlightenment also meant 
the kidnapping of Pius VI and his death while under arrest by French revolutionary troops, and the kidnapping and detainment at Fontainebleau of his successor, Pius VII, a broad-minded man who might have affected a new Catholic dialogue with modernity had he not constantly been bullied and worse by Napoleon. Nor was this Catholic experience in France unique. For while it is rarely recognized as such, throughout continental Europe, the formation of the modern nation state was typically undertaken against the Catholic Church, a pattern first adumbrated in Tudor England in the 16th century. Two principal examples on the continent were the Italian Risorgimento, previously mentioned, a deeply anti-clerical affair, and the Bismarckian Kulturkampf, an attack on the church that went iron-fisted hand in glove with the Iron Chancellor's assembly of the Second Reich and his early management of the new imperial Germany. And as if those were not enough, there was the Catholic experience of, quote, enlightened monarchy in the Habsburg lands where the Emperor Joseph tried to turn the church into what he called a department of the police. There were recurrent anti-clerical agitations in Spain and Portugal. And the 1834 Articles of Baden attempted to divide Swiss Catholics from the authority of Rome, an exercise in which they are busily engaged on their own today. Above all, and always lurking in the background, though, there, were the, there was the threat to the papal states. Gregory XVI's stance toward modernity was that of an unblushing and candid reactionary, a kind of papal metternich. He was not a monochromatic man. He had genuine artistic and intellectual interests. He was the pope who condemned slavery and the slave trade. He insisted on fostering a native clergy and building native hierarchies in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, thus ringing the changes on colonialism and its claims to ecclesiastical as well as political hegemony. Yet convinced as he was that the modern liberal political order was grounded in a religious indifferentism that more, that more often than not took the form of hostility to faith, he condemned the efforts of French Catholics like Lamennais, Lacordaire, and Montalembert to find a rapprochement with the new liberal politics. And he denounced freedom of conscience in the press and church-state separation in the 1832 encyclical Mirari Vos and the 1834 encyclical Singulari Nos, which at that point represented the high watermark of the Catholic rejection of political modernity and the institutional pluralism, especially on matters of church and state, built into it. The great papal historian J.N.D. Kelly does not exaggerate then when he writes that Gregory XVI left his successor, quote, a grievous legacy. That successor, Pope Pius IX, initially attempted something of a course reversal, initiating administrative and legislative reforms in the papal states and making positive gestures toward resurgent Italian nationalism. But the experience of the revolutions of 1848, when he was temporarily driven out of Rome, becoming the first pope to set foot on sovereign American soil when he visited old Ironsides in Gaeta Harbor, that experience turned him, against the turned him toward the rejectionist stance of Gregory XVI, after which the pontiff often marked as P.O. No, No, from his Italian name, set his teeth against further reform in his own domain, and stoutly, if futilely, resisted Cavour and the forces of Italian unification. In the order of ideas, this papal rejectionism reached a new plateau in 1864 with the encyclical Quanta Cura and its attached syllabus of errors, a root and branch rejection of modernity in virtually all its forms, which ended with the famous condemnation of the notion that the Roman pontiff, quote, can and should reconcile himself to or agree with progress, liberalism, and modern civilization. Then in 1870, Pius IX lost the last fragments of the Papal States when in the course of the Franco-Prussian War, the French troops protecting the Papal States were withdrawn to France. 
uh, and the forces of the Kingdom of Italy uh, claimed, Italy, uh, claimed Rome in a very uh, brief battle uh, before which the Pope told his troops to fire one volley for honor and then lay down their arms. So the Pope retires inside the Vatican and calls himself the prisoner of the Vatican. And here we come to a major irony. Because I believe what was perceived at the time, and not only by Pius IX, but by bien pensant thought all over Europe, that the loss of the Papal States meant the end of the papacy, and indeed the end of the Catholic Church, as a force in world affairs, turned out to liberate the papacy and the church for a different role, the role of global moral witness, which would be deployed just about 100 years later by a Polish pope to turn the history of the 20th century in a more humane direction. There's also a minor irony in the, in the drama of Pius IX, and that, it was, that is that through all of these contentions in which he was involved for 32 years, he became the most popular pope in history. And indeed, he became the first modern pope in the sense of the first pope whose papacy was at the center of Catholics' imagination about themselves. If you had asked the 35,000 or so Catholics who lived primarily around here uh, at the time of the American Revolution, a few up in Pennsylvania, a few in New York, if you would ask those 35,000 people, who's the Pope? I'd wager that only 5% could name Pius VI. The Pope was simply not part of the popular religious imagination of Catholics. Pius IX was the first pope whom most Catholics knew, this is the pope. He's the first pope whose picture people put up in their homes, all made possible because of newspapers and magazines and new forms of communication and whatnot. But here is this man remembered as Pio Nono, who in fact, ironically, creates the modern papacy as we know it. Act two, Catholicism explores modernity gingerly. Pius IX reigned for 32 years. The Cardinals meeting in February 1878 uh, to elect his successor uh, had one thing on their minds. We're not doing that again. So they proceeded in three ballots to elect a man they considered an old guy. He was precisely as old as I am today. His name was Gioacchino Vincenzo Luigi Raffaele Pecci, and elected as a elderly placeholder to keep the seat warm for five or six years, and then things would change. This man elected to prevent another 32-year long papacy, the longest in reliably recorded history, proceeds to have the second longest <laughs> papacy in reliably recorded history until he's topped by John Paul II in 2003. And at the very beginning of his pontificate, Leo XIII, who had spent the better part of a quarter century as Bishop of Perugia thinking through the problem of Catholicism and modernity, took a bold, grand strategic decision. Rather than simply just saying no, the church would engage the modern world across the full spectrum of modernity, cultural, social, political, economic, but it would do so with distinctively Catholic tools, freshly honed and sharpened for the occasion. You can see this grand strategic decision embodied in his funerary monument at the Basilica of St. John Ladder in the Pope's Cathedral in Rome. I'm sure most of you have been there. You remember, as you look to the left of the high altar, there's Leo XIII. And unlike other papal funerary monuments when the Pope is lying on his back, uh, 
with his hands piously folded, the Pope is kneeling, Leo XIII is standing up. And he's wearing the papal tiara, and he's in papal vestments, and he's got his right hand up like this, and his right, forward thrust, right foot thrust forward, as if he were saying to the modern world, we have something to talk about. We have a proposal to make. So that grand strategic decision was an attempt to find something else that was beyond both the rejectionism of his two predecessors, but also beyond the supine accommodation to modernity, particularly intellectual modernity, characteristic of a lot of 19th century liberal Protestantism, and to substitute for those two impossible strategies, as he thought of them, a third option. As I said, a Catholic engagement with modernity conducted with explicitly Catholic tools. In aid of forwarding that grand strategic decision, or embodying it, implementing it, he created what I have come to call in this book the Leonine Revolution, the effects of which are still being felt in world Catholicism today. It was Leo XIII who energized modern Catholic intellectual life with the 1879 encyclical Eterni Patris, which mandated a close study of Thomas Aquinas in the original texts, unfiltered by centuries of commentators. Thomas's brilliant appropriation of the new learning of his day, especially the rediscovered philosophy of Aristotle, suggested to Leo, as he was pondering this in his 25-year Perugian exile, that Aquinas was an especially apt guide for Catholic intellectuals seeking a critical engagement with modern science, modern philosophy, and modern theology. At just about the same time, Leo created as cardinal in 1879 John Henry Newman, who will be canonized in a few weeks, one of 19th century Catholicism's most imaginative thinkers. And that Leo would go out of his way to honor a man whose distinctive style and theological method could not be fit into any one methodological box, suggested that Leo, for all that he was a dedicated Thomist, was also something of a pluralist in terms of intellectual method. It was Leo XIII who opened the Vatican secret archives to qualified researchers of all faiths and no faiths, thereby inaugurating the modern Catholic study of Catholic history, which led, as he must have known it would, to the inevitable discovery that the church did indeed change over time, the claims of anti-modern rejectionists notwithstanding. It was Leo XIII who launched the first modern Vatican observatory and supported studies in astronomy and other natural sciences at the Vatican, thus beginning a rapprochement between Catholicism and modern science. It was Leo XIII who initiated the modern Catholic study of the Bible, an enterprise already well into its dissecting, deconstructive phase in liberal Protestantism, by creating the École Biblique in Jerusalem in 1892, issuing the encyclical Providentissimus Deus in 1893 on the higher criticism of the Bible, and founding the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1902. It was Leo XIII who, in the 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum, became the founding father of modern Catholic social doctrine, that distinctive Catholic philosophical and theological reflection on society, economy, culture, and polity under the conditions of modernity. And it was Leo XIII who in his 1895 letter to the Catholic bishops of the United States, Longinqua Oceani, taught that the liberal American political arrangement, namely the constitutional separation of the institutions of church and state, could be tolerated, thus opening the door to what would become in time the Catholic Human Rights Revolution, the Catholic defense of religious freedom for all, and the Catholic role in what Samuel Huntington dubbed the third wave of democratic revolutions. Leo XIII was a bit of a character. He, when he was 91 years old, a pious nun approached him and said, Holy Father, I am praying 
that you see your centenary. To which the Pope replied, my daughter, why put limits on the bounty of divine providence? <laughs> he died in 1903 at the age of 93, and it is no distortion of the record to suggest that the next five and a half decades of Catholic history were a contest, sometimes bitter, it should be admitted, over the Leonine Revolution and its attempt to engage modernity with distinctively Catholic tools. Leo's opponents generally won the day under the pontificate of Pius X from 1903 to 1914, but the Leonine party had its innings again during the pontificate of Benedict XV from 1914 to 1922. Benedict's successor, Pius XI, who reigned from 1922 to 1939, extended Leo's social doctrine and in his 1831 and 1931, excuse me, encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, with its principle of subsidiarity, underscored the importance of the plural institutions of civil society, both in themselves and as a barrier against the totalitarian temptation to which secular political modernity seemed to be succumbing in that low decade, the 1930s. Pius XI's successor, the much maligned Pius XII, who reigned from 1939 to 1958, actively fostered Christian democratic parties in post-war Europe. And in his teachings on Catholic worship, the Bible, and the nature of the church as the mystical body of Christ, rather than as the societas perfecta, beloved by Catholic anti-modern rejectionists, Pius XII, in a role little acknowledged today, helped prepare the theological foundations for the Second Vatican Council, in which, interestingly enough, in the documents of which, interestingly enough, his magisterium, the magisterium of Pius XII, is the second most frequently cited source after the Bible. Thus was the stage set by Leo XIII in the battle over his legacy for the next act of the drama of Catholicism and modernity, Act Three, Catholicism Embracing Modernity. Leo's fifth successor, John XXIII, was elected on October 28, 1958, as another elderly placeholder. And in this case, the conclave's expectations were met by a short pontificate of some four and a half years. But like Leo XIII, John XXIII took a bold strategic decision at the outset of his papacy announcing in January 1959 that he intended to summon the 21st Ecumenical Council in the history of the Church, which would be known formally as the Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican and informally as Vatican II. In a wide-ranging ecclesiastical career prior to his election as successor to Pius XII, Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli had experienced no small amount of the ecclesiastical air turbulence generated by the Leonine Revolution and the sometimes harsh reactions to it from anti-modern Catholic rejectionists. But while he was a man of quite traditional piety, as those of you who have read his spiritual diaries, Journal of a Soul, will remember, Roncalli was also a trained and accomplished historian whose specialty was the reforming uh, episcopate of Charles Borromeo in Milan after the Council of Trent, and his diplomatic work in Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, and France had given him a good understanding of the turmoil of the mid-20th century. Thus, he understood that the dynamics of engagement with the modern world that Leo had set in motion had somehow to be gathered together and focused so that the church might approach the third millennium of Christian history with renewed energy and a positive program capable of responding to cultural, social, political, and economic circumstances that had changed vastly during his lifetime. And that intention to focus these energies through the prism of a council so that the church would have a Pentecostal experience preparing it for a third millennium of evangelization and mission is, I argue in the book, supported by a close and unprejudiced reading 
of his magisterial opening address to Vatican II on October 11, 1962, Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, which I believe could be described as the opening trumpet call to the new evangelization. John XXIII only lived to see the first session of his council in the fall of 1962 before dying in June 63. But his example and leadership set a tone that lasted throughout the four years of annual Vatican II sessions in the fall of every year. By the time the council met for its fourth and final period in the fall of 1965, the party of rejectionism, the party that traced its ancestry to those who had resisted the Leonine Revolution, had been decisively rejected. And the council was prepared to consider and then pass its most distinctive document, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, known by the first words of its Latin text as Gaudium et Spes. Unlike other Vatican II documents, indeed unlike any previous conciliar document, Gaudium et Spes was an invitation to a conversation, or in the favorite trope of that day, to dialogue. In the pastoral constitution, the church sought not passive and obedient students, but active conversation partners with divergent and different worldviews. Thus, Gaudium et Spes was an unprecedented attempt to meet the modern world on the modern world's own terms, accepting almost ungrudgingly the dramatic cultural, social, economic, and political changes that had characterized the past two centuries of human history and finding in those changes more, more light than darkness. Yet for all that it may have seemed at the time to presage a new moment in the old drama of Catholicism and modernity, Gaudium et Spes seems in the retrospect of 50 years a remarkably time-constrained document, time-bound document. The pastoral constitution suggested, for example, that the two great challenges to biblical religion in the modern world were Marxism and Sartrean existentialism, neither of which has, to put it gently, a lot of traction today. The document recognized that women's roles had changed under the conditions of modernity, but it seems in retrospect oblivious to the tidal wave of ideological feminism that was about to wash over the Western world, raising the most profound challenge to Christian anthropology. The pastoral constitution noted the splitting of the atom, but it had virtually nothing to say about the two other world-changing scientific developments of modernity, the unraveling of the DNA double helix and the new genetics it made possible, and the invention of the oral contraceptive pill. Gaudium et Spes sympathetically explored the modern crisis of faith and suggested correctly that the church's own failures had to be taken into full account when measuring the advances of agnosticism and atheism. But most strikingly for today, there is not the slightest hint in Gaudium et Spes that the world just might become more religious under the conditions of late modernity and that revitalized religious conviction could play a determinative role in world politics. In other words, if Vatican II in its embrace of modernity did not imagine designer babies, gene therapy, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, and Europe's demographic winter, Neither did it imagine the solidarity movement, the moral majority, the entrepreneurial Protestantism of Latin America, the vast conversion of sub-Saharan Africa to Christianity, the house churches of China, or in a far less admirable vein, Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's Islamic State. Neither did the fathers of Vatican II imagine that in the church's European heartland, the greatest challenge to the religious worldview would not be atheism of either the Marxist or Sartrean variant, but massive religious indifference, what David Bentley Hart has usefully described as metaphysical boredom. Gaudium et Spes anticipated with seeming relish <laughs> 
a new respectful conversation between belief and unbelief, the pastoral constitution completely failed to anticipate the barely stifled yawn of indifference with which such proposals for dialogue would be received in the high culture of Western Europe within a few years after Gaudium et Spes was published. This failure to anticipate the religious ennui that would characterize Europe after the social upheavals of 1968 is one of the most striking features of the pastoral constitution read in the retrospect of a half century. And it suggests that the council fathers embraced modernity just on the cusp of its turn into post-modernity in which the truth the council fathers sought to explore in dialogue with believers of goodwill, with non-believers of goodwill, would be held to be either a chimera or a cultural construct. This can be put in another parallel way. Gaudium et Spes affirmed what one of its subsections called the rightful autonomy of earthly affairs and acknowledged that the methods proper to the modern scientific exploration of nature are, quote, at once the claim of modern man and the desire of the creator. But while the pastoral constitution did caution that, quote, once God is forgotten, the creature has lost sight of as well, the council fathers did not seem to anticipate what the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has dubbed exclusivist humanism, an aggressive secularism that denies not merely revelation, but even transcendent moral reference points for the ordering of social life. Thus, while the pastoral constitution usefully distinguished the three interlocking sectors of a modern society, cultural, economic, and political, it did not wrestle at any length with the ways in which the deterioration of the cultural sector under the impacts of epistemological skepticism, we can't really know anything, uh, moral relativism and metaphysical nihilism could do grave damage to both free economies and free politics. That analytic task would be left to one of the principal authors of sections of Gaudium et Spes, the Polish professor Bishop Karol Wojtyła, when he became Pope John Paul II. And that brings us to Act Four. Catholicism critiques modernity from within. In terms of the questions we're exploring tonight, and indeed in several other respects, the pontificates of John Paul II and Benedict XVI should be, I think, considered as a single moment of intellectual engagement with the cultural crisis of late modernity and the emergence of a postmodern world that is both robustly religious everywhere but in modernity's European heartland and deeply conflicted about its future. Gregory XVI and Pius IX had mounted a critique of modernity from without, so to speak. John Paul II and Benedict XVI, both modern intellectuals with distinguished pre-papal academic careers, offered a critique of late modernity in the emerging postmodern world from within a critique that began not with rejection, but with an acceptance of the accomplishments of modernity before turning to a critique of what both popes perceived as the dangers inherent in the late modern, postmodern world's deconstruction, self-deconstruction into incoherence. That internal line of critique was developed in several notable intellectual exercises among them, we can note John Paul II's encyclicals Redemptor Hominis of 1979, Centesimus Annus of 1991, Veritatis Splendor of 1993, and Evangelium Vitae of 1995, as well as his apostolic letter of 2003, Ecclesia in Europa. And we should note Benedict XVI's so-called September lectures at the University of Regensburg in 2006, six at the Collège de Bernardine in Paris in 2008, at Westminster Hall in London in 2010, and in the Bundestag in Berlin in 2011. That's an extensive body of material, but it can best perhaps be summarized and brought into focus by thinking back on a drama that unfolded in the last years of John Paul II. 
In 2003, a new constitutional treaty was being drafted for the about to be expanded European Union. And while that new Euro constitution was a very lengthy affair, indeed clocking in at about 400 and some pages, the most rhetorically violent arguments over its drafting and ratification had to do with whether a single word would appear in its preamble. Enlisting the sources of 21st century European commitments to civility, tolerance, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, would this framework document of the new Europe cite Christianity, or more broadly, the biblical tradition? For the draft constitution's original preambular text had assiduously avoided, indeed ignored, Christianity finding the cultural roots of the new Europe's commitments to democratic values and norms in, quote, the classical tradition, the enlightenment, and modern thought. As I wrote at the time, this would seem to mean that nothing of positive consequence for 21st century Europe had happened between Marcus Aurelius and Descartes, which was an awfully long time for nothing to have happened. But amidst the maelstrom of controversy over this question, which the international constitutional scholar Joseph Weiler, himself an Orthodox Jew, described as a byproduct of European Christophobia, the issue that engaged John Paul II and Benedict XVI was given concise formulation at the time of the controversy in a widely translated and published op-ed article by two paladins of European postmodern thought, German philosopher Jürgen Habermas and the French literary theorist Jacques Derrida, who argued that the new Europe must be, quote, neutral between worldviews. That, it seemed to both John Paul II and Benedict XVI, was a contradiction in terms, for it meant, in reality, the imposition of a worldview. The Habermas Derrida pr proposal flattened out the landscape of the late modern and postmodern world, forcing the rich plurality of European cultures onto a Procrustean bed that seemed constructed from Charles Taylor's exclusivist humanism. Indeed, the Habermas Derrida proposal amounted, in fact, to a bizarre, hyper secularized form of the old altar and throne alliances of the days of absolutism, state-sanctioned monism in which both European Union and national law enforced an extreme monotonal, monochromatic laicite, putatively in the name of social comity, in fact, in the name of deep epistemological skepticism. Put another way, the architects of the EU naked public square seem to imagine that democracy and the free economy were machines that could run by themselves, were the apparatus of governance, production, and exchange properly de uh, designed. In Centesimus Honest, John Paul II had explained in some detail why that was impossible. Yes, the machinery was important, and modernity had done a good job of building political and economic systems for self-governance, productivity, and prosperity. But, he argued, it takes a certain kind of people, living certain virtues, to make the machinery of the free economy and the free society work so that the net outcome is human flourishing. The formation of those virtues and the mature modern men and women who live them in a public atmosphere of civility and tolerance was the task of the third part of the triad of the free society, the moral cultural sector. And it was the vitality of that sector, often described as civil society, that would tell the tale on the vitality of democracy and the free economy uh, in the future. Benedict XVI deepened this Catholic engagement with and critique of late modernity and post-modernity from within in four important lectures. The first delivered at his old University of Regensburg in September 2006, frankly acknowledged the accomplishments of modernity in distinguishing religious and political authority in society and in defending religious freedom and freedom of conscience as fundamental human rights. 
At Regensburg, the former professor Joseph Ratzinger also celebrated what he termed the providential encounter of biblical wisdom with Greek philosophy, while affirming that human reason was a reflection of the logos, the divine reason. He also acknowledged that faith must be purified by reason, lest faith become superstition, and suggested that faith unpurified by reason was one cause of the religiously legitimated mass violence that was rocking the early 21st century world. If the Regensburg lecture was a reminder that in the Catholic view of things, faith must be reasonable, Benedict XVI's lecture at the Collège des Bernardines in Paris in September 2008 reversed the polarities and cautioned against a too narrow understanding of reason, suggesting that positivism was, quote, the capitulation of reason, and that a culture that deliberately cut itself off from the things of the spirit would become dull and eventually dehumanizing. In an address at Westminster Hall in September 2010, the German Pope, who two days previously had thanked the British people for winning the Battle of Britain in 1940, reminded his audience of parliamentarians and other distinguished Britons gathered in the very place where Thomas More had been found guilty and condemned to death, that law descends into tyranny when positive law is detached from the moral law that provides a kind of grammar for intelligible public discourse in a plural world. The Pope reiterated that theme in a different key a year later when addressing the German Bundestag in 20, September 2011, he reminded his listeners of Augustine's fifth century question, without justice, what is the state but a great band of robbers, and explicitly linked the lesson embedded in that question to the German experience of power divorced from right under national socialism. Then, while speaking a few hundred yards from the ruins of the Führer bunker from which the world had in his lifetime been driven to what he called the edge of the abyss, he returned to a theme he had previously articulated in Paris and suggested that a public intellectual climate dominated by positivism was a different kind of bunker, a bunker of the human spirit in which the new Europe risks suffocating should that positivism snuff out the robust dialogue of worldviews that could turn the mere fact of difference into the social accomplishment of pluralism. Immediately prior to his election as Pope, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger had preached a sermon to his fellow cardinals at the Mass Pro Eligendo Romano Pontifice, during which he warned against a, quote, rising dictatorship of relativism throughout the Western world. That is, the use of coercive state power to impose on all of society a way of life determined by the postmodern canons of epistemological skepticism and moral relativism. The use of coercive state power, in other words, to eliminate the robust dialogue of worldviews in the public square in the name of a tolerance prepared to tolerate everything but normative worldviews, whether those normative worldviews were religiously or rationally derived. That warning, when read alongside the substantive analyses of the crisis of late modernity and emerging postmodernity, articulated by John Paul II and Benedict XVI, suggests that after two centuries of wrestling with modernity and its attendant plurality of worldviews, the Catholic Church found itself in the paradoxical, indeed ironic, position of defending reason, modernity, and genuine pluralism and against the coercive efforts of postmodernity to deny the prerogatives of reason and to flatten out the dialogue of worldviews in the name of a state-sanctioned and indeed state-enforced monologue. There are indeed many ironies in the fire. And that brings us to Act Five in this drama, Catholicism converting modernity. While this internal critique of the public dimensions of modernity was underway, so was the fifth act of the drama. 
we can trace its origins to the confusions of the immediate post-Vatican II years, which Paul VI attempted to begin to remedy with the 1975 apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Nunciandi, proclaiming the gospel, in which he reiterated what John XXIII had said in Gaudet Mater Ecclesia in 1962, the church is about converting the world. Seven years into his own pontificate, John Paul II, on the 20th anniversary of Vatican II, summoned a special meeting of the Synod of Bishops in Rome in 1985 to look at what had gone right and what had gone wrong in the 20 years since the Council. And it seemed to the Council Fathers, the Descended Fathers of 1985, and especially to Pope John Paul II, that what was needed was a thread. Vatican II had produced 16 documents of varying magisterial weight, but unlike other councils, it hadn't provided a key to its own interpretation. There was no creed, there were no condemnations, there were no doctrinal definitions. Vatican II wrote no new canons into the legal system of the church, and unlike Trent, it didn't authorize a catechism. So what do you got that ties those 16 documents together and turns, if you will, 16 pieces of cloth into a beautiful and coherent tapestry? The Extraordinary Senate of 1985 said that the, the thread that can do that is the concept of the church as a communion of disciples in mission all three nouns being important. Disciples, in that friendship with Jesus Christ is the beginning of Christianity. Communion, because that friendship with the Lord Jesus immediately incorporates us into the body of his other friends. And mission, because that communion of disciples does not exist for itself, it exists to, other, uh, to offer others the gift it has been given of that friendship with the Lord. Five years later, in the encyclical Radem Torres Missio of 1990, John Paul II put mission back at the center of Catholic self-awareness, teaching that unlike previous eras when missionaries were specialized folks who went to strange parts of the world, and mission territory was those strange parts of the world. Now, in the emerging postmodern world, everyone, John Paul II said, is a missionary, and everywhere is mission territory. This reclamation of the essential character of the church, a communion of disciples in mission, which exists for the conversion of the world, has come just in time. For as John Paul II recognized, Benedict XVI certainly recognized, and others had better recognized, in the developed world, in the world we call the West, 20 years from now, at most 30 years from now, no Catholic, or at least very few Catholics, is going to be able to answer the question, why are you a Catholic, with the answer, because my great-grandmother was born in County Cork, or Krakow, or Guadalajara, or Munich, or Palermo, or Normandy, or the south end of Boston. The Catholicism of the 21st century and the third millennium will be chosen, not inherited by ethnicity or absorbed by some other form of religious osmosis. And it will only be chosen because the encounter with Jesus Christ, whose mystical body the church is, has been embodied by the people of the church, offered and proposed. And here we come to the deepest, and I believe most providential, irony of the story of Catholicism and modernity, 
through its encounter with the modern world, which began with such a harsh exchange of epithets, Catholicism has rediscovered the evangelical or missionary imperative from which it began two millennia ago. Through an often turbulent encounter with the modern world, the living dynamic parts of the Catholic Church today have learned that the Great Commission of Matthew 28 is addressed to the church of every time and place, and that the measure of true discipleship is the measure in which the people of the church <clears throat> offer to others the gift they were given in baptism. And in a paradox within that paradox, or an irony within that irony, the flattening of the human experience by aggressive secular modernity may have helped create a new openness to the gospel among those for whom Peggy Lee's lament, is that all there is, has become an antiphon to which the new evangelization responds like Peter at the first Pentecost. Well, no, it's not all there is, not at all. May I introduce you to Jesus Christ. Finally, this lens, this prism on the past 200 years of Catholic history, as I suggested in this hall several months ago, helps us get today's crisis of abuse and malfeasant leadership into clearer focus. The crisis that first came to our attention in 2002 and that reignited last year uh, is a moment of necessary, often painful, but essential purification for mission. Church cannot be the communion of disciples in mission that it has been called to be unless it is seen to live what it proclaims. So what we are being called to now uh, is not an abandonment of this trajectory over the past 200 years, but a purification of Catholic life, which involves everybody in the church, not just bishops and clergy, a purification for mission. And if we can come to understand this crisis in those terms, then I think we will get through it, uh, and we will come out the far end of it, strengthened for the mission to which the past 200 years of the Catholic encounter with modernity, and indeed the past 2,000 years of Catholic history have called us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so we do have time for questions. Uh, so if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we'll just dive right into it. We have Jason on the left, another microphone, Vinny over here on the right. Um, so please just raise your hand, and we'll get to you. We have one right here up front. Uh, <clears throat> yes, George, uh, you've been talking um, very eloquently about Pope Leo the Thirteenth and his his remarkable legacy. Um, why do you suppose it is that he has never been uh, put up for sainthood? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, the simple answer is that there was, you know, canonization causes, beatification causes begin with what the, thank you, with what the, is called in the technical language, a spontaneous local cult. You know, there gotta be a bunch of people who are regularly going to the guys or ladies' tomb, praying, seeking his or her intercession, etc. And there simply wasn't any of that at the time of Leo's death, in part because the people who were really uncomfortable with the Leonine Revolution uh, were in charge for the next 11 years. So that may have, have something to, uh, to do with it. There was also, for a long time in the church, uh, hesitance about beatifying popes and canonizing popes. Pius X in 1954 was the first pope who had been canonized since Pius V, Pope of the Counter-Reformation. Uh, that pattern seems to have changed a bit in, uh, in recent years. Um, 
But I think it has to do with the fact that there just was no, it's the same question about Pius XI, who I think was a great pope, and in fact, John Paul II described him over dinner one night to me in precisely those terms. Um, there was no spontaneous cult. Now, Pius XI was an extremely irascible guy. You, you did not want to get on, on the wrong side of him. Uh, Leo was a bit of an aristocrat, Little, little, little haughty is the wrong word, but he, you know, you, you knew who was the boss here. Um, but I think it's that there was no spontaneous local cult around him. Okay, great. Um, do By the way, since we're here at Catholic University. Um, somebody needs to write a really good biography of Leo XIII. That simply does not exist. There were a number of things written in the early 20th century that are, are kind of fingernails down the blackboard, uh, hagiographical, gooey, whatever. Uh, but he really deserves a serious biography that, among other things, takes those 25 years in Perugia very seriously because that's where all of this was, was gestated when he was in a kind of form of ecclesiastical exile. Yes, other questions? I see one up front. Please raise your hand while we're waiting. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very enlightening. I wanted to know how do you read the great confusion that came over the church after Vatican II if it was the manifestation of a problem that came from before, or a result of the council, even if it was a bad interpretation. Yep. And if it was the result of a, a previous problem, how do you read the Catholicism of the 50s, like the yeah. successful? Well, I get into this a lot in the book, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll just say a few things about that here. The night, John the 23rd, January, whatever it was, 28th or 29th, 1959, announces earlier that day at, at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls that he's, he's going to call a council. Uh, Giovanni Battista Montini, the Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, who would succeed John Twenty-Third as Paul VI, called up a friend of his. He had, you know, they both heard the news, un concilio. And Montini says to his friend, this holy old boy doesn't know what a hornet's nest he's stirring up. Church of the 1950s looks placid. It was not placid. There was all sorts of stuff going on under, under the surface. Uh, the church in Europe was, had been devastated by the First and Second World Wars in ways that I don't think it recognized at the time. Um, so that's, first of all, the, you know, the, the kind of placid Catholic 50s thing, and why can't we go back to that, which some people seem to imagine possible, what well, didn't exist in the first place. So there's no going back to what didn't exist. Second problem, I think, was this notion of a council without keys. Every previous ecumenical council had told you this is what we mean by, in the case of Nicaea, writing the creed that we recite on Sunday. Ephesus and Chalcedon, doctrinal definitions. Um, condemnation of heresies and heretics, uh, canons written into the law of the church. Uh, Trent, as I mentioned, um, uh, authorized a catechism, the Roman catechism, lar largely written by Charles Borromeo, or at least edited by him. And those were keys. They, you know, this is what we mean, and here's how we know that this is what we mean. Vatican II did none of that. It was, um, this idea was first given to me by a friend of many of us here, now Archbishop uh, Gus Denoya, who was working at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, who said to me 20 years ago, Vatican II was the council without keys, and that's why there was all of this stuff. That's not the only reason. Let's not forget the 60s. Uh, the council was just beginning to be implemented when uh, Europe just implodes culturally in 1968. Uh, 68 was a bad year here in, in many ways. 
uh, which many of us remember, but it was nowhere near as bad here as it was there. I mean, that was a real cultural breakpoint, as significant as 1789, I think, at least in Western Europe. So the ground for the reception of Vatican II in Western Europe was really shaky. Um, and uh, then there was the character of Paul VI, who was an extremely intelligent man, so intelligent that he could, as, as one of his close uh, colleagues said to me, he could see every side of every question but then he had a hard time coming down on his side. Um, then there was the whole explosion over Humanae Vitae. But he, he kind of, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to do this in the book because there's a lot of you know, deprecation of Paul VI today. He, he kind of pulls it out at the end. I mean, he gets, pulls on the yoke and the plane starts flying a bit more level again. With this 1975 exhortation, Evangelii Nunciandi, which um, the uh, Brazilian Dominican who helped write it, Lucas Moreira Neves, said uh, in print and to me was his pastoral testament to the church. This is what he thought we should be about. And that cues up the new evangelization. So I think those are some of the factors involved. I, I am absolutely convinced that the Second Vatican Council was essential and I explain why that's the case in the book, and you can imagine that that will not go over well in some uh, circles, but they, they often draw good cartoons of me, so I'm looking uh, forward to that. So we have another question towards the back. Thank you, George. Where are you? Disembodied voice right in here. the back. Hello, hey, Hi. hello, Father. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. In the drama, um, between the Catholic Church and modernity, who could be some of the other major players, non-hierarchical major players, maybe some of the saints from the Catholic Church or on the other, on the other side, who contributed to the, to the whole drama? Thank I did not pay Father to ask that question, <laughs> but I will say that the answer to it is to buy the book, because in between each of the five acts, there's what I call an entre-act, an in-between act. And in those entre-acts, I discuss particularly the theological figures ranging from one of the real founders of Catholic social thought, Wilhelm Emanuel von Kettler, to John Henry Newman, uh, to more in more contemporary mode, uh, the French Dominicans, Chanu uh, and Congar, uh, a variety of uh, German thinkers, uh, Father John Courtney Murray from the United States. Um, there was a lot of ferment going on in between these acts that, that, that kind of cues this up. I mean, men who, who ought to be studied today but aren't. Carl Adam, Johann Adam Muller, Matthias Schieben, on whom John Courtney Murray wrote his doctoral dissertation. Uh, these were very significant figures almost totally forgotten today in our kind of mania with, with presentitis, uh, which help explain what was going on. Now, it, it has to be said that this ferment um, of which Montini spoke to his friend that night, this holy old boy doesn't know what a hornet's nest he's stirring up, uh, was, was rarely experienced here. It was experienced here primarily in terms of the argument over church and state, and, and a Catholic theory of church and state and religious freedom, which had a, had a, in this campus had a big role in that, uh, in what turned out to be the losing side, but that's another story. Um, uh, but we didn't experience a lot of this ecclesiological ferment, this ferment over the very self-understanding of the church. Uh, why? Because we were too busy building institutions. I mean, this was the institutional building phase um, in the 1940s and 50s, especially on steroids in the church in the United States. Um, and it was primarily in, in Europe that this intellectual churning was going on. Uh, that rarely touched here. Uh, I think, you know, men like Avery Dulles were, would have been aware of this. 
but it, it just was not part of the intellectual mix in the U.S. Uh, in those preconciliar uh, years. So, no, thank you for bringing that up. There's a lot of connective tissue between these acts to wildly uh, mix the metaphors here, uh, physiology and drama. Um, but uh, they're very important, and I hope I reintroduce to people some very important characters who don't get the attention they deserve today. So perhaps before we all rush over and buy the book to read all about that, one more question. I, I, I was looking over here, but I didn't see. Oh, there is a hand over there. OK, I'm sorry. Vinny, you want to help her? And then maybe we'll a final question over here. Um, can you expand on why you dedicated the book to Don Briel? Uh, because I loved Don Briel, and he died shortly after I was really getting going on this book. Um, and we had discussed uh, uh, many of the, this whole line of argument uh, for 10 years. And so it seemed to me the appropriate thing. For those of you who didn't know him, Don Briel uh, was the founder of the Catholic Studies Program at the University of St. Thomas in the Twin Cities. Uh, I believe one of the two or three most important Catholic educators uh, of the post-conciliar period, uh, a great, great man who died uh, far too young of a of an incurable double leukemia, um, so I, that's that's what that was all about. Final question right here. Can we turn this back on? Thank you. I was just wondering if you could expand or respond to how we can awaken, I guess, that yawn of indifference that you were speaking of, uh, that we encounter so many times how we can awaken those people today in this work of new evangelization. I think we got a lot of tools that we didn't have uh, before. I'm often asked this um, in you know, diocesan convocation or parish settings. And you know, I say to people, Here, you know, here's one idea. Invite your friends over for you know, a little wine, a little cheese, and the first episode of Bishop Barron's Catholicism series. It's so beautiful, it's so compelling, that they'll want to come back. Um, that's one very practical idea. Uh, I think in the longer, uh, in the larger societal uh, view of things, um, this is, this is, the Western world is becoming a cold and unfriendly place. Um, siloing of opinion, everybody cranky all the time, um, and, and a kind of madness in the air, which we experience in a peculiar way here in, in, in Washington. And I don't mean just political madness. I mean the kind of cultural madness that produces some of the things we see on the streets here and in the media and whatnot. If we can, in the quality of our own lives, whether those are institutional or familial or whatever, model something better, something warmer, more compassionate, and then out of that encounter with warmth in a chilly world, people will start to ask us what they asked the Christians of the first two or three centuries. How can you live that way? What makes, what makes it possible for you to live that way? It's, uh, it's, it's tough for people who make their living out of ideas and arguments, to concede the point that Rodney Stark has made in at least a half a dozen books right now, now, that if a third to a half of the Mediterranean world was converted between the first Christian communities leaving uh, the Holy Land about 70 AD, you know, moving out, if, if that small seed grew into such a, a large tree, uh, it wasn't primarily because of argument. 
you know, Paul didn't make it on the Areopagus. You know, he, he's trying to be clever and, you know, deal with them on their terms and, and, and whatnot. And once he gets to the resurrection, you know, ball game, we'll hear this later, thank you, and good night for NBC News. Um, it was example. Uh, it was the example of a more humanly rich and noble way of life. Now, you know, martyrs obviously figured into this as well. And ideas were important. But what, what turned the world into the world that Constantine decided he better join the, the winning side here uh, was example first. And that's, I think that's a paradigm for our, for our own, uh, for our own uh, times. Um, and you know, th th this also has to be done at a very retail level. Uh, I often say to people, if, you, if you've got somebody who's dropped away from the church or uh, is just you know, religiously um, absent, uh, invite them to come to Mass with you. you know, let's go out to brunch on Sunday, but would you come to Mass with me first? I also say make sure the music is decent and the preaching <laughs> is good because you know, this can go the other way in a hurry here. Uh, so you have to be a little choosy in, in where you take people. But... Um, uh, you know, it can be done at a very retail level, and that's, of course, the way it was done. I mean, Paul, you know, doesn't work on the Areopagus, but he gets a few people, and uh, off we go from there. Okay, look forward to meeting a lot of you over there. Thank you Great. very Let's much. Thank you. Let's thank George. Thank you.